The final part of this talk hopes to answer a question that I'm sure many of you have at this point, which is if we have found all of these exoplanets, all of these planets outside of our own solar system, are they actually habitable? Can we live there or can other life live on these planets? First question that we need to ask ourselves is, what exactly do we need to live to make one of these planets habitable? Well, can't be too hot, uh, can't be too cold. We're also desperately gonna need some kind of atmosphere, some kind of air. And what else do we necessarily need to live or for life to exist? We're absolutely going to need some water. All of these characteristics, particularly the temperatures uh, and the atmosphere, those are very highly dependent on the characteristics of the star that the planet is orbiting around and also how far away the planet is from that star. Hence why you'll find a planet like Mercury very close to the star is completely uninhabitable because it's way too hot there. Or if you go all the way out to Pluto, that's entirely uninhabitable because it's too entirely cold for anything to survive. And so that motivates the definition of what we call the circumstellar habitable zone, which is sort of a ring around the star in which planets could potentially have the characteristics for life. Now that ring, the width of that ring and where it's located will depend on the size and the temperature of the star that it's orbiting around. And so hotter stars, that ring will be much further out, whereas cooler, redder stars, that ring will be closer in and a little bit narrower. Where is the closest circumstellar habitable zone planet to us? Well, that actually happens to be Proxima b, which I talked about earlier. Proxima b is located in the habitable zone for its host star. However, due to other circumstances involving stellar winds, Proxima b likely has no atmosphere and so it's highly unlikely that we're going to find life. At least on the surface, there could always be mole people underground. Ross 128b though, which is located about 11 light years from Earth, three times as far as Proxima b, it's also in the circumstellar habitable zone of its host star. And we're not 100% sure that it doesn't have an atmosphere. And so we can't entirely rule out that possibility. If it does have an atmosphere, then we're able to determine that Ross 128b would have suitable conditions for water, which then means that it could potentially have uh, life on that planet, or at least could have the conditions to support life on that planet. Another question though that we need to ask ourselves when we're looking for uh, habitable planets or even defining the idea of habitability is what's our baseline? And if our baseline is Earth, we have to ask ourselves, is Earth just sort of okay when it comes to defining habitability? Is Earth the most habitable planet that we know of? And there are scientists out there that argue no. Uh, Earth is not sort of the gold standard for habitability. And in fact, they argue that looking for exoplanets might suffer from something called anthrocentrism, where we decide that you know humans are the most, an absolute important thing in the entire universe and we have to define our idea of habitability based on whether or not humans could live there. But if we're just trying to figure out whether or not a planet could support life, we can't just be thinking about human life. We have to be thinking about all sorts of species that could potentially exist. And that's led these scientists to define a different set of conditions for what they would call a super habitable planet that might be better suited to support life and to support, most importantly, biodiversity than Earth. Here, I've listed some of the conditions for what a super habitable planet would need to have and compare to what we have here on Earth. So to start off, stuff like the mass of the planet, uh, the radius of the planet, so for the Earth, the mass is one Earth mass, radius is one Earth radius, no surprise there. Uh, for a super habitable planet, they claim that the mass of that planet would be about twice the size of Earth, whereas the radius would only be about 1.2 times the radius of Earth, which by the way would lead to the surface gravity uh, on these planets to be about 1.4 to 1.5 times what it is here on Earth. So we might all be a little bit shorter, but it's not necessarily a deal breaker in terms of gravity. The host star, if we compare between Earth and one of these quote super habitable planets, on Earth the host star, 
our sun, about 4.5 to 5 billion years old, but they argue that for a super habitable planet, they would want that host star to be a little bit older, maybe on the order of 6 billion years old. So that would allow more time for life to develop on that planet and for, uh, and for life to sort of branch off into multiple, multiple, multiple different species. Of course, that host star can't get too old because if it does, then the star might die and then all life's gonna get extinguished on the planet and then it's a moot point. However, they do say that that host star should be a little bit older than what we have here in our solar system. As far as the atmosphere here on earth, the atmosphere is about 21% oxygen, but for a super habitable planet, the atmosphere con uh, oxygen concentration in the atmosphere should be a little bit greater than 21%. Again, that promotes increased biodiversity on this planet. And then lastly, the surface temperature. Here on Earth, surface temperature is around 59 degrees Fahrenheit. But on one of these super habitable planets, the surface temperature should be on the order of about 75 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So certainly a little bit warmer, but not to the point that it gets too hot for life to survive. You might notice if we look at these conditions, you know, a little bit warmer surface temperature, a little bit more oxygen in the atmosphere. What kind of condi conditions are we describing? It's almost like a giant rainforest, which should make sense because where on earth do we find the greatest amount of biodiversity? It's in the rainforest. We're not finding it up on the North Pole. We're not finding it down in the South Pole. We're not finding it in the deserts either. So a super habitable planet would in a sense just be a giant rainforest, of course, with some oceans so that water could be there. And if that's the case, then that would be the ideal planet for supporting the highest level of biodiversity and life. To this day, there have been, I believe, 24 superhabitable planets that have been uh, found out of the 4,000 plus exoplanets that we have discovered. And certainly more are to come as we find more planets. But that doesn't necessarily answer the question of whether or not there is life and where the aliens are on these planets. So if you want the answers to those questions, you'll just have to come back next month as we talk about the search for extraterrestrial life in April.